The Financial Sense Midweek Edition with Jim Paplava. Delving in-depth with authors and experts into the key economic issues. Joining me as my special guest on the program today is Dr. Mark Faber, editor of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report. Mark we're at a point, it seems to me, in history where government debt imbalances are growing at such an alarming rate that it appears the only way out is to inflate. The imbalances, whether you're looking at the United States or Europe, are too large. And I don't think this concept is totally understood by investors, especially wealthy individuals. What does this mean in terms of how governments are responding with their central banks to this problem? Well, basically, it's quite obvious that all central banks would like to reduce government debt as a percent of the economy by inflating. And over time, you can do that. But obviously, it may not create a lot of prosperity, but rather problems down the line. And the question is, you know, to what extent do you inflate? Because, uh, say, in America, the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, will put, say, inflation at 2 to 3% per annum, when, in fact, the cost of living increases for people is more like between 5 and 10%. So we have strongly negative real interest rates, both on short-term deposits and even on government bonds. So basically... There is a significant loss in the purchasing power of money. Hard assets are selling off on the day you and I are speaking as a result of a release of the Fed minutes in comments made by the Fed. I believe at least we're more likely to see some form of QE3, maybe it's in the summer, later on the year. But it seems to me, Mark, the Fed is playing a confidence game with the markets at the first sign of weakness in the economy I think the Fed could blink like it did in 2010 when it was telling people it was writing op-ed pieces in the Wall Street Journal describing an exit plan, and then at Jackson Hole, Bernanke announced QE2. So your thoughts on this? I find it quite funny to talk about an exit strategy or an exit point because that they don't have, and I think there will be no exit but continuation of money printing But I have to give credit to Mr. Bernanke. If I were in his shoes, in the current situation, with the S&P having risen to 14.22 the other day, I wouldn't embark on QE3. I would rather wait and announce that there won't be any QE3 for the time being, or depending on market conditions or on uh, economic conditions, and wait what happens. And if the market sells off 100 points on the S&P or 200 points, say we drift down to 1,200 on the S&P, then come as again the big savior of the whole financial system by implementing QE3. You've made comments in the past that you've been reluctant to short stocks given all the money printing. And I remember, Mark, distinctively, last November, I was reading a lot of prominent technicians who were talking and making dire market predictions on what was about to happen to the market. And I can remember going to bed, watching the futures market. The futures market were down. And I woke up the next morning. Six central banks announced a currency swap. The market was up 500 points, and it's been up ever since. So... As you just mentioned, I don't believe they're going to allow the markets to drift down too far, as you mentioned, maybe 100 points or a 10, uh, maybe 15%. So doesn't this make shorting the market a risky proposition when you have these kind of interventions? Yes, I mean, my view was that last October, November, and December, 
that sentiment was very negative. There were large short positions outstanding, and most people were actually predicting a meltdown in the market because of Greece and so forth. And the opposite happened. Because of Greece, the market rallied. Because, because of Greece, they printed money. And in a money printing environment, it was very tough to be short because in real terms, asset prices may go down, but they go up in nominal terms. And so I still feel that the risk is fairly high by being short the entire market. Now, if we talk about being short individual situations where there is a deterioration in the business of one sector or one company, then yes, I mean, there are people, they do pair trades. In other words, they're short one group and long another group or short one stock and long another stock, and they do it uh, quite successfully. But in general, I would say in this money printing environment, I would be careful to be heavily short stock. You mentioned Europe, and I want to move on to Europe next. We had this massive $1 trillion LTR program, which led to a relief rally. Uh, a lot of commentators thought that Europe has dodged a bullet, but Europe still has a fiscal union problem. In your opinion, Mark, can Europe come together on a, in a fiscal union? If not, then how long before they face another crisis? Things aren't going well in Greece. Yes, I think uh, that another crisis is coming, whether it's, uh, again, Greece or Spain or Portugal or Italy, across the board, yes, I think another crisis is coming. But as an investor, you have to ask yourself, what are the investment implications? And I think it's nice to be an academic and say the crisis is coming for this and that reason. But the investment implications are clearly that they will print more money. But I'd like to make one observation. You know, this money printing business succeeds up to a point. It doesn't succeed forever. And money printing is essentially inflation. You increase the quantity of money in the system and you try to increase the quantity of debt. In other words, you try to avoid the deleveraging process, which actually would be important to happen. But that they try to prevent. And the difficulty is when you create monetary inflation, it doesn't touch everything at the same time. Uh, at certain times it may go into wages, or it can go into commodities, or it can go into consumer prices, or it can go into real estate, or it can go into equities, or commodities, or precious metals, or art prices, and so forth, and so on, but not at the same time. And the Fed, basically, since 2008, has expanded its balance sheet with the intention to stabilize the housing market and boost housing prices. But that is precisely the assets that hasn't gone up. To some extent, they stabilize it in some areas where real estate you know, is no longer declining, but basically it isn't rising in value. Except, and this is the anomaly that we have today in the marketplace, except in Aspen and on Madison Avenue and Park Avenue and so forth in prestigious locations around the world, real estate has continued to go up in value. Right now, the sovereign debt markets seem to be behaving. Uh, we've seen yields come down on Spanish and Italian bonds, but I guess a question is for how long. They're trying austerity combined with money printing. But how long, Mark, can government austerity work without incentives given to the private sector. For example, the opposition candidate in France wants to raise taxes to 75% on individuals making a million dollars. And I don't know if that appeals to the private sector to expand. They've got a new carbon tax on airlines. So I don't believe you can tax and print your way to prosperity. Well, certainly you cannot tax your way to prosperity. I would say what ought to happen in terms of austerity is that you would reduce the involvement of government in the economy very substantially. Say in America, the tax laws now, I just read the other day, just the explanation for you to fill out your tax return is 86 page long. Mm. 
you know, you could simplify that by having just a flat tax period. But, of course, simplicity doesn't appeal to certain interest groups like the accountants and the tax consultants and the financial advisors, and then then, then they would have to lay off people. And so you make everything much more complicated. But as you just pointed out, you have an expansionary monetary policy, but a restrictive regulatory environment where there are more and more regulations that actually stick to any business expansion. I mean, I know lots of small businessmen, they have no appetite whatsoever to employ people. Is it possible, given this kind of scenario, Mark, in the U.S., Europe, and Japan, with quantitative easing as the main policy tool, the result is you still get a weak economy or weak economic growth because of the structural impediments, but as a result of QE, you get strong equity markets. In other words, the money's got to flow somewhere. Businesses, as you mentioned, aren't keen to hire people or maybe build new plants, so the money goes into speculation, which is the stock market. Yes, that's exactly what I tried to explain before. You know, the money flows somewhere. And before year 2000, it flowed into NASDAQ stock and essentially technology, telecommunication, media. And then it flowed into the housing market. And in 2008, we had a commodities bubble. And now it flows into equities. And the more money you print, the higher equity prices can go. Because in a money printing environment, eventually people wake up to the fact that to hold cash balances is a losing proposition due to the loss of purchasing power that occurs annually at the rate at the present time of, say, 5%, because inflation, the cost of living increases are, say, 5 to 10%, you have zero interest rates, so you lose out. And so people go and buy Andy Warhol paintings and all kinds of assets, including equities. And uh, I want to make one point very clear. If you print enough money, the Dow Jones can go to 100,000 or 100 million or 100 trillion. You just go and look at what happened in Zimbabwe. <laughs> and Mr. Mugabe is basically the economic mentor of Mr. Bernanke. Speaking of the economy, in the U.S., economic conditions have improved since the third quarter of last year. The leading economic indicators are up, and even the ECRI, weekly leading index, is up despite their recession forecast. Bernanke and the president have been quoted that they're pleased with the economic progress, but they were also pleased in the first half of 2010, the first half of 2011, only to be disappointed as growth slowed down abruptly after stimulus faded. So, Mark, are we likely to see or repeat a similar pattern again this year once the Fed's, uh, let's say, Operation Twist ends and other stimulus ends. Well, let's put it this way. The economy, that is correct, has stabilized. But I wouldn't rely too much on the publications of statistics this year because we are in an election year. And I think it's a reasonable assumption that the Obama administration will try to make statistics look better than they are. The fact is simply that if you look at the stock market action, cyclical stock, Economic sensitive stocks are performing miserably. So that tells you maybe something more reliable about the global economy than what the Obama administration is trying to tell us. You know, a couple of problems I see here developing in the U.S. One is rising energy prices. Nationally, we're close to $4 a gallon. Here in California, we're approaching $5 a gallon. Housing, especially non-residential structures and personal income, haven't improved, although the job market is getting better, but a lot of the job market improvement has been temporary jobs. We have factory utilization at a point where in the past it would give way to rising inflation rates. I don't know, Mark, if the Fed can handle this if the economy weakens at the same time prices rise, for example, as a result of energy or some form of commodity inflation, even though you and I believe that these inflation statistics are understated. Does it put the Fed in the bind if, as a result of rising energy,